everyone. Good morning. Merry Christmas. And you know, it, it's we've we've exceeded our time here at the church. Um, like it says, you know, so many things. It says um, that there is a welcome and a greeting. There's a congregational hymn. There's a message and a close. All that could be uh, done away with because once those kids get up here and they sing and they are so beautiful and wonderful, that's the message for this morning. Everything else, you know, they're a tough act to follow. You know, they are so good. And there's been so many here this morning. A church that has kids has growth. And I go around to a lot of churches and people will say, oh, yeah, we used to have kids in here and they were crying and, and they were loud. Now it's nice, you know. And I'm thinking, yeah, very quiet in here. You know, the, some of these churches, it, it's a shame to say that some of them basically are what you would call like a dead church. And, you know, one time I tell the story, one time I was at a church in another co county and it was considered to be a dead church because there was about 12 people in there. And, you know, I, I wondered why they even came, you know, because they didn't do anything. Turn the lights on, go in, sing a song, put money in the basket, tell the preacher he did a nice job. And the last one out locked the door and, and turn out the lights. And I, I said to somebody once, I was in this church, and he goes, yeah, that's kind of a dead church. I says, yeah, somebody actually one day really passed away. They come in, the paramedic, they went to nine people before they actually found the one that was dead. So, <laughs> well, this church is alive. You have so much going for you. You have a wonderful mix of age. You have uh, you know, people that want to teach, which is really very important. The kids, to have them is one thing, but to nurture and teach them is really a tough thing to do. And you do that well. The people who have taken on that mantle of teaching, uh, they're angels because they are preparing the future. And, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, hard to do. Make sure those kids come and prepare them. So when they go later, they'll say, you know what? I remembered, I learned that from my Sunday school teacher. We hear that a lot. Me and my wife, we both taught, you know, and all. And kids will come back to town like now for, our, for Christmas. And they'll say, I just remember you teaching Sunday school. And it was so nice. I learned so much. And you don't know that then. But then later they come back and tell you. And it's just wonderful to hear. So don't stop what you're doing. You're, you're, you are on the right track. You are doing God's work. And, and don't ever get down because you are doing what you're supposed to do, what, what God has called you to do. I want to read something here. I heard... You know, you hear so many songs at, you know, Christmas time, which is great. The Christmas songs, the Christmas ties, you know, you only have them one time a year, so you've got to make the most of them. And, and I told a young man here that, that had on a beautiful tie that had Santa and everything on it, wear that tie in June because Christmas is all year round. You know, bust out the tie in July. Why not? Christmas is not just a little box that you have and you put away. Christmas is all year long. And to have that spirit, it, it's most now, but it should spread. It should stay like the whole year. And, and it's hard. It takes a really religious, wonderful, um, like I guess you'd say selfless and confident person to go out and proclaim Christ was born in the summer. You know, people don't want to hear it then. But it's the truth. Christ is born, and he is living, and he was raised for 30 years before he started his ministry. And you have to go and tell people that. They need to hear the, the Christmas story all the time. 
Another one is Christmas songs. Love them. Um, the different channels that you have and, and you could on your radio. And, and I, I have a channel on my radio that's really nice because you hear all the Christmas songs, but they're sung by different people. They're sung by Casting Crowns or Mercy Me or Michael W. Smith. And this one I heard was sung by Amy Grant. And I'd like to just read a little bit from this. It's, uh, the song goes, I've made the same mistake before. Too many malls and too many stores. December traffic. Christmas rush. It breaks me till I push and shove. Children are crying while mothers are trying to photograph Santa and slay the shopping and buying and standing in line. Whatever can I say? I need a silent night, a holy night, to hear an angel's voice through the chaos and the noise. I need a midnight clear, a little peace right here to end this crazy day with a silent night. December comes, then disappears, faster and faster every year. Did my own mother keep this pace, or was her world a different place? Where people, where people stayed home, wishing for snow, they had three channels on their TV. Look at us now, rushing around, trying to buy Christmas peace. I need a silent night, a holy night, to hear an angel's voice through the chaos and the noise. I need a midnight clear, a little peace right here to end this crazy day with a silent night. Amen. Amy Grant, Chris Eaton are a couple of songwriters, and they just did a wonderful song on that. And as I'm running back and forth doing things, and that song comes on, you can almost feel, you look at your radio, and you can almost feel like there's a little finger coming out and it's pointing at you. You know, when you're driving down the road, you know, it's like, oh, hey, wait a minute, you know, but you know it's true. We need a silent night. Uh, our, our song here that we sang a little bit ago, it came upon a midnight clear. If you look at, the, at some of the words in there, it says, peace on earth, goodwill to men. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing, O rest beside the weary load. The songs that we sing tell us how we should be acting. Now, you know, we need a silent night. It, it seems like you get, well, anymore, Thanksgiving is going to be overlooked. I'm so afraid that Thanksgiving is going to become like Arbor Day or, or something where it's a holiday, yeah, but you really don't put a lot into it because you know why? Christmas is coming. So we have to start. Used to be you would start like definitely the day after Christmas. You know, Black Friday would, would begin. Then it got to be where Black Friday you could go in at midnight, which was right at the end of Thanksgiving. Well, then it's once you eat your Thanksgiving meal and you're stuffed and you have gravy, you need to walk all that, walk all those pounds off. Why not come to the mall? You know, and, and it just encroaches so much more and more onto the Thanksgiving season. But Christmas is a busy time. There are a lot of things going on. I'm not going to ever doubt that we need to have some activity. And, and it makes Christmas special when you go out and you do things. And as it, it talks, you know, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to... Uh, do a lot of what Jesus talked about. I heard in here the ministries that you have. You have the angel tree. You know, you have how many of the shoe boxes that were sent out. You know, uh, this church uh, sent out probably double what, what is, was expected, you know, and that is a wonderful thing. That is pure 
generosity. And it's so funny that a lot of people from uh, the church that I, that I would go to say, okay, here's your box, and you'd say, okay. And you'd say, well, I have two kids. All right, here's three boxes. Oh, where's your wife? Okay, here's one for you too. So we would take our four boxes, and we would go to the dollar store or dollar general or dollar whatever, and we would look around and we would buy things. And I think what is reason that the, that the shoe boxes are so popular and that they do so well now, that God blessed us by creating more dollar generals and more, you know, dollar stores so that we could go and take stuff. You know, you go in there, you could buy like little toys and little clothes and coloring books and different things. They have all those things in there. You just walk up and down the aisle and generally you have a box. Then you have to go get a cart and then you, you know, you fill up your box and you have a bunch left over. Well, I learned that you just take that in whenever you take your box in and they'll use that to put in other empty boxes and they'll fill up even more. So Christmas time, the ministry that is done is, is just wonderful. And I, as I understand, you all have done very well in that regard. Treating other people, bless it. And, and those kids, I know for sure that when they open up those boxes, they are just so blessed because a lot of them don't have anything. A lot of them really are that, you know, and, and I was told this morning, and I agree with this, absolute, sometime in your time here at the church, deliver those boxes. Don't just go get the stuff and put them in the box and seal it up and put your money in that you're going to use so that they could ship the boxes and stuff. Literally say, hey, do you need help delivering the boxes? And usually people do because, look, a lot of people don't go to deliver. You will come home absolutely blessed because you'll see that what your little box does to help people, to help kids, to make their Christmas. And, and you know, as I was saying to a young man here, we were talking uh, down in the, in the fellowship hall, you want to see wonder? We don't see wonder very much. Now we can. You can look at the kids' eyes at Christmas time, and you actually see the concept of wonder because kids still have that. And if you have kids and you're able to do that, you are so blessed. We don't have kids. Well, we have two kids, but now we have five grandkids now. So uh, to, yesterday was ba making four gingerbread houses. Oh, my gosh. I learned a lesson, you know, I do a lot of work around the house, and you use tubes of caulk, and you use adhesive construction. The icing that comes in those gingerbread houses, I'm going to start using it on, like, paneling or something. You put that icing on, and you put the gingerbread things together, and you turn around, get a drink of water, and come back. In order to get those parts apart, you have to break them, because that thing seals like quick seal or something, like epoxy. No wonder the kids can't eat it. We told them, no, you don't get to eat this. You know, this is not for eating. This is for construction. But it was, a, it was a fun night. The kids, you know, they just so were into making their little gingerbread houses wonderful. And you could look at them and see awe and wonder and, and delight. Something that our world is in short supply of right now. So we need to see that stuff. We need to see, and we could see that through the eyes of kids. Christmas is a, a, a wonderful time. Um, you read, you heard already the, the, the scripture. Uh, I'd like to look back at one here because the little town of Bethlehem, you know, that, that's a, a song that we sing. And I look up here and I see the shepherds in the fields looking down over, really, a little town. It wasn't very big. Bethlehem was a very small town. Micah, when he predicted that Jesus was going to be, when he prophesied, he says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, 
whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Micah predicted and prophesied this a long time before Jesus was born. And it, it worked, you know, it was like to, to our advantage it worked, but also a little bit to disadvantage because when uh, the king there was looking to find out where, would you, where is the town, where is this place that Jesus is going to be born, this, this king, they went back and looked at prophecy and says, the town of Bethlehem. And he knew then that's where his, quote, possible adversary was. Uh, kings back then, many rulers were so paranoid. And you just, you know, think, you, you know the story of what all happened uh, in the town of Bethlehem. But Jesus was born in that little town. And out in the fields were those shepherds right there and they were sitting and they were watching and they were watching their flocks that were over out in the fields. Luke 2, let's look here for a moment. In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken for the entire Roman world. Now Luke takes special interest in relating in his story about this the history the, you know, some world history. Caesar Augustus was an emperor there. He expanded the empire to include the entire Mediterranean world, and that, of course, included Israel. He established his what was called Pax Romana. So, you know, this uh, Augustus Caesar issued a decree that there was going to be a census taken. And that really wasn't a good thing to have a census taken. Even now, people try to dodge the census taker or, 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 you know, when the census thing comes, they throw it away. But back then, it wasn't a good thing because what he was looking for was two things. He was looking for how many people there were, especially how many men there were, so he could get soldiers. Now, the Jewish people did not were not allowed to serve in the Roman army, so that part of it didn't pertain to them. But to all around the, the Mediterranean world, he wanted to find out how many soldiers he could draft. They would drive into, you know, go into a town and, and, as a, uh, you know, a horse and all the things, the chariots and everything. And when they left, they'd say, okay, let's see here. Uh, you and you and you, come on. You are now part of the Roman army. you just been drafted. That was one of the things that a census did. The other things that a census did was to find out how many people there were. That way, Augustus could raise the taxes. He, you know, the, Rome built everything. If they had a plot of land, my gosh, they built something on it. And if, in order to build things, you needed money. How are you going to get money? Get more taxes from the people. Find out how many people there are. That way we can up the tax burden that we have put on them. So out of this bad thing, out of Caesar Augustus saying, you have to go back to your home and you have to register for the census, he was doing it for his own gain, but he was fulfilling prophecy because Joseph was from the house of David and he went back to Bethlehem where Micah predicted Jesus would be born. So out of that, uh, his edict was prophecy fulfilled. Then it talked about here, it says the shepherds. You know, the shepherds out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flock at night. Shepherds were a really, you know, they were a, I don't know, I guess you'd call it a real paradox because they took care of the sheep and the lambs and all. The lambs, the sheep, and everything was very important to the economy of Israel. They used the lambs, many of them, for sacrifices. They would sell the lambs to people that came into Jerusalem during uh, you know, the Passover and things and make money. They would eat the lambs. They would, uh, you know, certainly, certainly use the wool to make clothes. 
Lambs and sheep were a very big part of the economy uh, of the Israel nation. So they were very, very important. So the people that watched them, the shepherds, you would think, wow, they would really have them and hold them on really a high esteem. But they weren't. Shepherds were like the lowest of the bunch of everything. You know, they were just right above lame and blind and, 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 and uh, pagans. You know, the, the, the poor shepherds did a very important job, but they were not treated like it. And it was a shame that, you know, that's how it was. They, they did a very important thing, but they didn't get any important knowledge or any important recognition. Well, they were doing their job. They were out in the fields keeping watch over their flock at night. They were silent. To the shepherds out watching their fields, watching their sheep at night, you know, they would, they would go around and walk the perimeter, you know, maybe scooch the sheep in to where they were close by and in a bunch. They would make sure there were no predators, whether they be animals or people. People would come in as, as much as they could and try to steal sheep and take them home because they needed them for, for things. Or they would take a sheep and, and sell it. So they had gone around and they made sure all their duties were done. All the sheep were coming in and just getting ready to be bedded down for the night. And it says here in, in Luke, it says there were out shepherds out living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. One of the versions says the, the, the shepherds were out sitting, watching their sheep. They had done all their work. Now was time to have a silent night. They wanted a silent night to a shepherd was important. It meant that there was no troubles. You know, no sheep got stolen. There was no wolves. There was no anything going on. A silent night to them was what they hoped for night after night after night. So they learned to, to embrace the silence, as it were. Well, on this night, it was going to be a little different. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. The Lord, there will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. All of a sudden, bang, their silent night was broken. And like so many times, the angel appeared. And when you talk about here, uh, it, you can say like Moses, Moses saw the Lord. And, and it was said that the, the Lord says, I'm going to sit down and talk with Moses as friends talk, you know, man to man. But when Moses asked him, can I see your glory? You can't. You cannot witness the glory of the Lord. It, it's too much for, for people to see. However, here it says an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord lit up the skies. Can you imagine what it would be like sitting there out, embracing the silence, maybe dozing off a little bit, sitting, and all of a sudden, the sky, as far as you could see from east to west, was filled with the glory of the Lord. I mean, that's a concept that's hard to understand. Because all of a sudden it is silent, and then bang, you have the glory of the Lord. And the first thing, of course, the angels, many angels, when they come, say to the people right away, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Because those, those shepherds weren't used to this. 
you know, something coming like that, all, all of a sudden the sky is totally lit up and they're probably cowering away, got their hands down, you know, not able to really look up and see what's going on. The glory of the Lord shine down on them. That's like, in a way, that's like us. Before Thanksgiving, you're going along, it's nice, you're preparing, doing, it's kind of silent. Then all of a sudden, bang, Black Friday. It appears the mall lights are everywhere. Your commercials on TV are talking about going to the pre-Christmas sale. You really have three sales at that time. You have the pre-Christmas sale, the Christmas Day sale, and the after-Christmas sale. So you could take advantage of all those if you want to. The sales just don't end until uh, the Super Bowl starts, and then, then you got Super Bowl sales. But, you know, this is how we are, kind of like those shepherds. We're just, like, quiet, everything's fine. You know, it's coming into November, coming into Thanksgiving, maybe the kids have off and you know you're you're baking and doing things. You're looking at the Thanksgiving traditions that you have where people come and visit, sit down and eat. Anything that doesn't run away they eat, you know, and, and just like have a nice family time. Bang! All of a sudden the glory of the malls appear. You know, and, and they don't say us they don't say to us, don't be afraid. They don't want you to be afraid. They want you to come to the malls and bring your money, by the way. Don't bring cash, bring your credit card. That's faster. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth, peace. To those on whom his favor rests. Peace. Peace on earth. That's something that we haven't had. Somebody talked a long time ago that they went back as far as they could to civilization, as far back and all the thousands of years, whatever, up until now. And there was only like uh, 400 years where there wasn't some kind of a war going on. We have not had peace on earth. And you say, well, what about those 400 years? And somebody said, that wasn't peace. That was just people reloading and getting ready for the next war that was coming. We haven't had peace on earth the way the angels proclaimed for a long time. You can have peace, though, in your heart. You can have peace in your church. You can have peace in your family, maybe your town. There can be peace. It just takes an effort, and it starts with you having peace inside. You know, before you go out and you talk to people about Jesus, make sure you know how you feel about Jesus. You want to go talk to people about being peaceful? Make sure you are peaceful. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord had told us about. So, it's quiet and everything, and then all of a sudden, bang, the angels are there. They sang a song to the shepherds, and they left. And the shepherds are probably like, whoa, did, you, did we see that? Did that happen? All right, all right. They said to go into Bethlehem and that there would be a, a manger. Now, who better to find any manger in Bethlehem, any sheep pen, because that's, usually, that's really where Jesus was born, was probably in a lambing pen out behind the, an inn or something. So it would be like a cave, and Jesus would be in there. Who knew every little lambing pen or every little cave that had sheep in it other than those shepherds? They were like professionals. So they said, go in and you will find him, and this will be for you. You'll find a baby lying in cloth and lying in a manger, lying in a feeding thing, a feeding trough, basically. And right away, the shepherd says, let's go and find this thing. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this. So they hurried off, 
They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was, in the, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The fact that the shepherds would even approach somebody. Because as I said, they were kind of lowly people. Well, here they are. They come to town and they're going to go. They know exactly where the places are. Maybe they went to one or two places perhaps. But then they said, okay, then they have to be over here on this one, you know, on the corner of Elm and Maple here in Bethlehem. We're going to go and we're going to go in there. And they went and they actually approached Mary and Joseph. Mary just had a baby. Oh my gosh, these guys are going to barge in on Joseph and Mary after she has just delivered a child? These shepherds? Well, they did. They went in. And they told Mary and Joseph. They said, oh, here's what happened out there. A, a great company of angels came and we were afraid. But they said that there was good news in Bethlehem that a Messiah was born. And Mary right away, it's, if you look at the scripture a little bit in, in verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary knew that her child was destined to be special even before he was born. Mary knew. Mom knew. Mary was the only person in the world that was with Jesus from when he was born to when he died uh, at the crucifixion. And then she was with him when he came back and when he ascended into heaven. Mary was Jesus' sole partner, his mother, his, his divine person that was uh, the Holy Spirit used to give birth to Jesus. So whenever the shepherds come in and they just have to be talking like a mile a minute, you know, we are these angels and this is what they said. And they said we'd find the Messiah here. And oh my gosh, we oh my gosh, we were scared. But we, you know, after they left, we come in. And Mary's just sitting there going, oh my, I knew this kind of stuff. I, I figured this is what I've been thinking about. And she treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. So we had this big explosion of angels. We had them running into town, barging in on Joseph and Mary whenever they were there with the baby. They saw the baby Jesus. They probably had like a, a, a trough there, and they put hay and stuff in it and laid Jesus down in it. And the, the, you know, the shepherds were, were right at home there. I mean, they're used to the, the lambing pens and the caves and things. So they just walked in and they saw the baby Jesus and told everything what was going on. And then they left. You know, it was like the shepherds were here, very quiet. And then all of a sudden there was this noise and then they left and it was quiet again. And then they ran in. Well, here was Joseph and Mary, very quiet. And all of a sudden, these shepherds, you know, kind of barge in and tell them everything. And then they leave. It said they left and they were singing and praising God back to their fields. Well, then it was quiet for Mary and Joseph. When they got back there, they were probably sitting and, you know, you had to be quiet because you, you had to hear things. So maybe the shepherds were quiet back here as well. They had a quiet time. Then they had a wonderful thing, a wonderful happening that they enjoyed. Mary and Joseph, the same way. The baby was born. The, the shepherds came and confirmed the things that Mary had been thinking about. And then it was quiet. They had a silent night. We have a week now until Christmas. A week from today. I hope that you have the times that you need. I hope you have 
the big times, the angels talking to you, when you're driving alone in your car and a, and a Christmas carol comes on and you dare sing it and you think you sound just like the guys think they just sound like Frank Sinatra and they're just singing that, that Christmas carol, you know, because you can do that when you're alone. You know, you sound like whoever you want to be, you know, really good. Maybe you sing out and, and enjoy those times. But there needs to be a silent night. There needs to be, you know, maybe the first of this week might be busy. But as you get into the later in the week and such, you need to have some silent nights to get ready for Jesus' birth. Because as it was predicted, he came and was born. Now we're waiting for him to come back. We don't know when that could be, but he is coming back. And I hope we have a lot of silent nights until that happens. But right now we have a week. And I wish for you the best thing that maybe I can wish for you all people. I just hope that you have some silent nights before next uh, Sunday, before Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing your son to be born. We know how everything goes down the road. We know how Jesus ends. We know how his life goes. But right now, for Christmas, your son is being born to us. We need to treasure that in our hearts like Mary did. We need to welcome the King. Amen.